So, we got any fishermen out there? Okay, that's great. I myself am a bit of a fisherman, or at least I used to be. Of course, I was a bait fisherman. You know how we do it. You take the worm and you put it on the hook. I wasn't a very patient fisherman. I think all those years snagging salmon up in Alaska kind of ruined me for waiting too long. If I chucked that worm out in the creek, if I got a nibble in a minute or two, I, I might hang on for half an hour, but then if I didn't catch a fish, I'm afraid I'd give up. You see, for me, it was all about catching the fish, but how many of you are fly fishermen? Okay, now you know there's a lot more to fishing than catching a fish. I understand this because I've observed fly fishermen over the years, particularly if I observed my favorite fly fisherman, and that's my big brother, Chris. He's a fly fishing master. He spends all this time preparing and doing, and he doesn't care if he catches a fish or not. It's all about that dance, you know, 10 to 2, 10 to 2, whoosh, so great. He not only ties his own flies, he builds his own fly rods. Now, I'm going to explain this to you just to see how persnickety these guys can be. He take the four on blank and cut it into proper lengths, just the size he wanted them to be, and he'd attach them. He prepare to attach them all together with the links and then he'd tie on the eyelets and when I say tie on that's what they do they put the eyelet down there and then they tie it round and round and round with loops of beautiful colored silk thread never overlap always side by side back and forth build it up strong and then you have to seal it with lacquer now this is lacquer that dries in 10 seconds. You think you put it on, you'd be done. But no, that, that didn't satisfy my big brother. He, he had an old washing machine motor. He'd attach that fly rod to that and get it rotating. And then he'd take his lacquer drop and he'd put it on those threads and he'd rotate round and round for 24 hours until it had dried equal thickness in all sides in perfection. Yes, perfection. That's what fly fishermen are about, and I guess that's why they find so much joy and success in their adventure. No, I am a part of my brother's uh, tackle box. Uh, no, I'm not the bait. Uh, I'm his trail marker. Uh, he needs a trail marker now and then, especially at his favorite fishing creek, which is Mount Nash Creek. If you've ever been to Union Falls, you know where Mount Nash Creek is. You know, you come out of Lawl and Drop on, down off Proposition Ridge, and there it is. You hike back up to come to the fork where the Warm Fork and the Falls Fork come together, up to Union Falls, back over to Scout Pool. Yep, that's the place. But those are the things that interested my brother the most. He was interested in that stretch of creek between the forks and the cutback. Of course, the trouble is, if you're not careful, you're fishing down the creek with your mind on business, you're going to miss the turnoff and end up down Beckler Canyon. So my job was to hike straight in from the switchback and sit there at the side of the bank until he came down the creek and we'd collect together. Of course, it's catch and release only, so Yellowstone Park, you understand. That's fine with the fly fishermen. And uh, then we'd hike back home for supper. So on the morning, uh, sent him off up the trail to the fork. His belief was that you fish from hole down to down, you kind of heard the fish in front of you. Go figure. Fly fishermen make their own rules. And I would go in and sit by the bank and wait till it came. Now you know if you want to see wildlife, you can't go tramping around in the woods looking for it because it'll hear you coming and it'll be gone. But if you sit quiet and just listen, then you'll find it out. And so that day, I slipped down to the side of Mount Nash Creek. I pulled off my red wings and socks, slipped my feet down into that water. Not too cold, because it does mix Warm Fork and Falls Fork a couple miles up the stream. And lay back, looking up at the clouds, just a few puppies in a dark blue sky, beautiful trees all about. You know, I was afraid I'd die and go to heaven and be disappointed. Of course, it's movement you're watching for, and 
pretty soon I saw one shooting around is that beautiful western tanager. How many have seen those? They have them there. Well, bright orange wings, golden head. And it was a, it's a flycatcher. It was pacing those big staghorn pine borer beetles right out of the air. Kind of like a jet plane taking out a helicopter. It was pretty impressive to see, I'll tell you. And then as I watched, I saw your Stellar's Jay. Looks like a blue jay, only it's bigger. But it washes black to bright blue at the end of its feathers. And that beautiful Stellar's Jay started dancing with the little fir tree. Yeah, I did. He'd land on one side, the tree would bend over, he'd land to the other side, he'd go this way, land to the back. Pretty soon he had that little tree just going around in a circle. It was right out of Oscar Wilde. It was kind of exciting. And then, of course, I saw it, the deer. That's what I've been hoping for, better than a bear. And uh, not many bears back in those days. I'll get to that in another story. But I'm watching it there coming out into the middle of the creek, a beautiful four-point buck in that red coat they wear in the summertime, and uh, antlers still in the velvet. He walked out in the middle of that stream, stood there so majestically, and did in Mountain Ash Creek, what do deer do in Mountain Ash Creek, which makes you not want to drink the water. <laughs> but as I said, it's movement you watch for, sure enough, a few minutes later, a movement caught my eye, right up along the bank of the creek. But as I studied it, I realized it, it wasn't an animal. It was another fir tree. Probably in the high water of the spring, it had been undercut and, and it dropped down into the stream itself. And now, as the water would build up in the twigs and branches, <clears throat> it would take and push that tree right down, almost parallel to the bank. Now you engineers will understand how this works. The water's pushing the tree down, but as the tree goes parallel, there's less to push on, and there comes a point where the tree has more spring than the water has push, and back it comes. And then the water would catch it again and push it back down in almost parallel to the bank, and then it'd spring back up again. Now I noticed that this action had worn almost all the bark and needles polished that tree almost white, except as I looked right out there to the end, there was a green fir cone sitting in a little crotch right there at the end of the tree. Now, tell me what color a green fir cone is. No, this is not a trick question. I mean green as in a not ripe fir cone. Okay, that's right, it's purple purple cones. Now, you all know how dug fir cones and spruce cones work. They hang in the tree like this, and when they're ripe, the brown golden scales open and the little winged seeds fly out through the forest. But that's not the way with a fir tree. On a fir tree, the cones sit up at the top like a crown or the candles on a birthday cake. They sit there getting ripe and ripe, and when they're ripe, they explode, they're deciduous, and the scales and the seeds blow across the forest. But it almost never happens. You see, squirrels eat those cones just like they're candy. They'll climb up to the top of the tree and cut them down, kapop, to the ground, and they gather them up and they stuff them in their dens, in their holes, for future times ahead when there isn't so much to eat, and then they'll be fine. Of course, it's just like life, you know, the squirrel that risks everything, climbs to the top and cuts the cones, risking the fall and the hawks. He almost never gets them, because that kerplop is a warning, and the squirrels that are bottom feeders hear it there, and they come and gather and stash. Of course, there is justice in nature, Sure enough, about the time that squirrel gets that den filled up, along comes a grizzly bear, and he'll dig it up and eat the whole pile. <laughs> Probably the squirrel along with it, too. Justice is justice. That's what they say. But anyway, 
I was surprised to see this green fir cone still sitting out there uncollected. But you know, sure enough, even in my, as I'm watching, here coming out along that little tree is a big bushy tail red squirrel. Now he'd start out along the branch and he'd kind of take a dip and get his little paws wet and he'd back off. He did this two or three times until finally he got up his nerve. He shot right out to the end of that tree, grabbed that cone. He's standing there just looking so proud. And then right at that minute, right at that second, up out of this big pool came the biggest trout I've ever seen in my entire life. Whoa! Took that squirrel right off the end of that tree. No, this is true. But what's even more amazing is about 30 seconds later, that trout came and put that cone right back up in the end of that tree. No, this is true.